Hi, I am Christina Etter, and this is my video podcast on Seed and STEM. In this podcast, I'm covering some of the cool science and technology that's impacting cannabis consumers, along with some product research and development that's absolutely changing the game for cannabis and hemp consumers everywhere. Now, when I started this blog and video podcast, the entire goal was to bring some valid and relevant news cannabis consumers can use without all of the fluff and the hype and the BS marketing schemes that are out there now. So if you've been following along at all, you know that I've kind of developed sort of an opinion on Delta 8 products and other synthetically produced cannabinoids that are coming out of the hemp industry. And in my opinion, kind of leading the consumer on a little bit. And they're touting these products that are able to promise a a legal high. And unfortunately, I think that these kinds of marketing schemes are not worth the attention that they're about to draw to the hemp industry. So now my opinion clearly doesn't carry much weight. I'm just a journalist and a podcaster. But my guest today has a bit more authority on the subject than I do. Eloise Thiessen is a board-certified adult geriatric nurse practitioner who specializes in cannabis therapy. And for more than 20 years, she has worked primarily on cancer, dementia, and chronic pain patients, which we know is in a plethora in the United States these days. But for the last six years, Eloise has focused her efforts on cannabinoid therapies, and now she's the president of the American Cannabis Nurses Association. Now, as a medical writer for Leaf Report, the CBD industry's peer-reviewed watchdog website, Eloise joins me today to talk about the latest report findings in a comprehensive review of hemp-derived Delta-8 THC products. So she is talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Welcome to the show, Eloise. I'm absolutely thrilled to have you here today. Thank you, Christina. It's a pleasure. So before we dive into this topic of the hour, um, let's talk about you first and, and just kind of get some introductions out of the way. I want to learn a little bit more about your background and kind of what led you to the role that you have today in cannabis. Sure. I, you know, I think many of us come to the cannabis industry through personal experiences, whether it's our, you know, ourselves or someone that we love where we see cannabis work remarkably as a medicine for chronic conditions or age-related illnesses. And that's what brought me to cannabis was a personal experience. Uh, Working in oncology, I started to see many of my oncology patients asking about cannabis. You know, they would turn to what I call Dr. Google and ask, you know, how can I manage my symptoms? And cannabis started to come up quite a bit. And we were in California at the time, this was about 2013-14, where we had had medical use for, you know, over, you know, 15 years, but we didn't have any regulation. So there was a lot of concerns as a healthcare professional about safety and efficacy for my patients who were, were incredibly vulnerable. Um, so I started to navigate the cannabis space more and decided to start this practice where patients who wanted to get true sound medical advice on how to use it and where to go and what to expect and how to find a good product. Um, Would they have drug to drug interactions? Um, I set out to kind of fill that gap that was really and still is pretty prevalent in the medical cannabis industry Um, and have seen about 7,000 patients now since then who want to use cannabis as a treatment modality. That is so wonderful. And I got to tell you, that's a topic too, that is also very near and dear to my heart. I lost my mom in 2014 to lung cancer, Um, lost my sister in 2011 to breast cancer, lost my dad in 2008 to lung cancer. So I've had a lot of uh, loss in my family due to cancer. And I'll tell you in 2014, it was really when I started to hear a lot of those stories about cannabis and cancer and the potential that was there And when my mom was diagnosed with lung cancer, I asked her, I said, you know, do you want me to go out to Colorado, you know, just a fact finding mission and and see what I can find? And her response to me was, it's not legal in my state and I don't want to die a criminal. So she completely turned away from from cannabis back then. 
you know, because she was afraid of that stigma and the stereotype. So for me, it, it really is a phenomenal thing when I get to see professionals, medical professionals like yourself, really start to step in and, like you said, bridge that gap and start to provide some of that information for people that really are, you know, desperate for some solutions or desperate for anything really that can help them manage the 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 ailment or the you know whatever it is that they're dealing with so i i love to hear stories like that and coming from the midwest there is i know that there's a lot of divide in the medical community when it comes to using cannabis as a legitimate medical therapy so I'd love to hear your position on that, and and obviously you're you're a supporter of cannabinoid therapy, considering what you do. But what are your perspectives on the divide that we have right now in the medical world? Yeah, I we've so we've made the good news is we've made progress. You know, I don't want to um, say we haven't made any progress. When I started in 2013, the response that I would get from my colleagues is much different than it is today. So I see. Um, you know, that patients have really led the movement here and have been seeking information and sharing that with their clinicians and, and the clinicians are seeing results. So they're starting to accept the use, um, but we're still not seeing this push or, um, you know, we're not seeing a lot of clinicians becoming educated on cannabis to to help their patients. So there's still a sort of this you know, so there's a specialty of cannabinoid clinicians, and I think there always will be. But even, you know, your pain management doctors, your oncologists, they're not even getting the foundational knowledge that they need to at least provide patients with something that allows them to access it safely and effectively. And so, you know, most of the pushback from the medical community has to do with the lack of research. And I don't think that they really understand the challenges around why research has been so lacking. You know, the history and the prohibition and the stigma and, and the racism that's been involved in, in cannabis for so long is, you know, a huge learning curve in itself. So we, we still have a lot of work to do. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, now it's it's starting to look a little better. I mean, things are starting to look a little brighter. We see where the, the DEA is starting to grant more licenses for people to do that qualified scientific research that we really need to support some of these claims that are coming out of the industry. And, you know, there's companies I just interviewed a couple of weeks ago, um, Dr. Jeff Chen with Radical Science that's teaming up with with producers to help put a little more, you know, research and validation behind the things that that we're hoping that the research is going to show. And and I know that we have to remain open minded and we have to remain kind of neutral in that aspect. So we do get that good qualified research and that the research isn't skewed. Um, but I think good things are coming now that that veil is really kind of starting to lift. Yes. I agree. So let's dive into the whole idea of these um, lab produced, synthetically produced cannabinoids, because I feel like they're really, really starting to flood the market. We're seeing more and more of these products um, come into the consumer market. They're being touted as you know, the, the, the legal high or marijuana light. And, and it's just, it's really kind of weird to me to see all this kind of happen. Now, before we really dive into the meat and potatoes of Delta 8, though, I do want to preface this conversation for any of the audience members listening. Although I have an opinion on Delta 8 and how it's being produced, I'm not against the cannabinoid per se. I believe that all cannabinoids serve their purpose and that even in this instance where they're being lab produced, that down the road we are going to find purpose and, and meaning for these cannabinoids. But I truly feel like the consumer is being disillusioned right now in, in the marketplace. I feel like um, hemp producers, Delta 8 producers, a lot of times are looking more towards what can be profitable versus what is safe for the consumer. And so I'd love to hear first off from you, what was the motivation that you took to do this study with Leaf Report and what kind of prompted the, the attention 
I think, in, in these Delta 8 products. Well, I think like you said, Christina, there's many Delta 8 products flooding the market and it seems to be, you know, the next boom and consumers are unaware. And, you know, just like with CBD right now, there's, you know, over 3,000 you know, companies out there can get very overwhelming and confusing to know where to go and where to start. And now we're seeing this, you know, sort of the same thing happening now with Delta 8. So Leaf Report brings transparency to the CBD space, and they wanted to do the same thing with Delta 8. So they looked at 38 products, which 20 of them were from brick and mortar stores and 18 were online retailers, and then went and tested them with a third party testing facility in Las Vegas um, to bring that report and transparency to consumers so they can start making educated decisions if they want to use Delta 8 and, you know, did the rating system of A through F. Um, again, because, you know, one of the common questions we'll get is, well, what, what brand do I trust? And, you know, the best way to bring that transparency is through testing um, to show them what's in the product and whether or not it is safe and appropriate to use. Right. And just in my conversations that I've had, I've, I've talked with different labs. Uh, I talked with Pro Verde. I've had conversations with um, SC Labs and uh, Infinite Cal. And it, it seems like I'm kind of hearing a similar sentiment from everyone is that, you know, depending on the process and how it was made, it's hard telling what is in some of these products. I've seen chromatograms, the, the chromatography readouts from some of these products, and, and they just have a bazillion peaks on there, and, and God knows what is, is remaining in some of these products. What In your report and in your refinings, what were some of the most astounding things that you discovered? Yeah, it was the the most surprising, but probably not the most surprising, was the amount of THC, the amount of residual THC that was found in the products that was above the legal limit. Um, in fact, it was as high as 15% in one of the products. So again, now you're, you're seeing the consumer has expectations of this product that they think they're getting, right? Like, you know, we hear these reports of it's a half to two thirds as strong as Delta 9 THC. And if you have these higher levels of THC, Delta 9, along with the Delta 8, you know, that experience can, you know, we're not really sure what that experience is like when you have those two cannabinoids together. Um, there was no absence of, I'm sorry, there was no evidence of heavy metals in the reports, which was good, but we're not sure, like you said, about these residual solvents that could, or, or other chemicals that could be um, coming in as a result of the, the chemical process, you know, the acid wash that they're doing to convert these, you know, CBD and in some cases, Delta 9 THC products into Delta 8 THC. Um, so that's another area where we need to, to have more vigilance and transparency. Most definitely. And I mean, I know that testing um, is still kind of, uh, what do I want to say? It's a little unstable. You know, there's, there's no real standards. You can go from one lab to the next. You're going to get different test results, different things that are going to come up. And I understand that we really need to work from a, from a regulation standpoint on, on standardizing some of these test results. Even the CBD industry is still having issues, I know, with labeling and making sure that they have the correct amounts on, on the different products. But what amazes me about this in, in terms of Delta-8 is, like you said, most, not most, I, I, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of the products contain more Delta-9 than, than they report. So the question then becomes for me is, is the consumer that's taking this product actually seeing the benefit that they're getting or the effect that they're getting from this product? Is it being caused by the Delta 8 or is it being caused because they're actually consuming more Delta 9 than they realize? And until there's some standardization, we just don't know. We just don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, half the products, so 53% had... Um, THC levels above the 0.3% legal limit. So it was significant, I would say. Right. And another conversation that I had recently too was talking about how small a quantity quantity um, Delta-8 is actually produced in the plant. It's, it's smaller than most all other cannabinoids. It comes in very, very tiny, tiny, minuscule amounts. 
But the, the simple fact of the matter is, is we don't know the safety profile of consuming 300 milligrams of Delta-8. We've always, you know, in the, in the human consumption form or through the plant natural consumption form, it's always been tiny, tiny amounts. And so there's always questions around what are large doses of these cannabinoids going to do? Yeah, you bring up a great point. I mean, we, you know, when I look at the research, there's only nine primary studies on Delta-8 THC, and those aren't even necessarily, they're not, not all of those studies are looking at the effects of Delta-8 THC on conditions. You know, some are looking at um, you know, how the liver metabolizes it. <clears throat> Some are looking at, you know, a lot of them are um, animal models, um, lab models. So we have very, very little clinical human data to help us understand um, what conditions Delta-8 might be most appropriate for and what effects we're going to see uh, with certain dosages. So it really is concerning as a healthcare consumer that you can see some of these products out there that are 25 milligrams, you know, per dose. And we don't really, you know, we always talk about going low and slow, but we really don't have any standards to, or best practices to work from when it comes to Delta-8. Exactly, exactly. And that's, you know, that's the other thing too, is that with so little regulation in the industry and, and no standards in testing and having all of these different little nuances with hemp production that can happen, what what needs to change? What do we need to do in order for consumers to be able to trust the information that they're given with these products? I always come back to education. You know, I think education touches everything. We need to really bring, you know, that's what I love about the LEAF report and that transparency. You know, LEAF report's not taking any money from these companies to test their products. So, you know, it's a, it's a trusted report in that sense. And, you know, it, it helps bring awareness to the consumer. I think as a healthcare professional, my role is to uh, bring, you know, to advocate for these patients and the industry to, again, bring, um, you know, change and regulation that is going to keep our patients safe. That's always, that's what brought me into this is an unregulated market in California and the lack of regulations leading to safety concerns. Because, in the medical community who already doesn't necessarily trust cannabinoids or consider cannabis a medicine, I think it's important that we try to be the best examples that we can be when we're producing these products. And when we're, you know, trying to market or make claims, we don't want to be outlandish with those claims because we're going to, it's going to become divisive and we're not going to be able to move forward if we take that approach. And I'll tell you, I think that's one of my biggest fears in, in how I'm seeing things play out is, you know, it just takes that one bad actor. It takes one company to get someone either super sick or to have them have an adverse effect because of too much Delta-9 or not understanding, you know, what all is in that product. It takes one. And then as soon as that happens, then there's going to be the spotlight on the industry and and there's going to be so many repercussions because of the fact that you know we're kind of skirting in on, on the fringe anyway in terms of acceptability and stigmas and stereotypes from the past and so i i fear that one bad player that isn't flushing their products right or isn't getting things right and then they're putting a product out there that may have you know a residual chemical or something in there that could cause a problem and then that's going to be a black eye on the industry as a whole and and that i think is one of my biggest fears with these products and now on the flip side of that the biggest pet peeve i have is that how much they're pushing this as an intoxicating product and in, in the world of hemp and CBD, I just don't feel like the regulations as they were assigned in 2018 ever intended for an intoxicating product like this to, be out, to, to come out of the hemp industry. And I really feel like this is eventually going to draw some attention, probably negative attention, and it's going to impact the market as a whole. Again, someone else that I've talked to in the past reminded me that if we are making a regulated cannabinoid 
out of an unregulated market, it's not going to take long before that unregulated market <laughs> is now forced to become regulated and forced to become, you know, a lot more red tape for things like wholesale CBD or whole, uh, isolates or or things like these because I, I it's eventually going to change the way I think our governing bodies look at the hemp industry. So I'm curious on your perspective on that. What do you think the future really holds for Delta 8 and for hemp producers in general in, in this market? Yeah, I think you brought up some really important um, points. And, you know, we we do need to be careful. We saw this with the Ivali crisis in 2019 pre-COVID, right, with vapes, um, where vitamin E acetate was being added in. And we I believe there were like 66 deaths related to it. Um, so we have to be really careful that we're not repeating history there with Delta 8. And, you know, we're seeing states, I think there's 11 states now that have outright banned Delta 8. We're definitely seeing um, legislation in about four or five other states. I mean, the, the states are going to move quickly. And, and that's sort of what's happening is, is, you know, if we have these, you know, irresponsible companies out there, then, you know, we have this um, rush from legislators who are, again, largely uneducated and can be easily influenced through stigma and fear to, you know, make these laws that are not in the best interest of our patients or consumers. You know, that's, that's one of my biggest concerns. The other is around euphoria um, and this conversation that we, um, we, you know, in the oncology world, euphoria is a welcomed side effect. You know, when my patients are going through chemotherapy and they're miserable and they're facing the end of their life and their quality of life is, is truly um, going to doctor's appointments every day and, and feeling nauseated, if they can laugh and, and feel happiness and joy for a little bit, you know, that's, that's something that I want to encourage. So I don't want to see our, the irresponsibility lead to people not having the freedom of choice, that if they want some euphoria, um, you know, that that is, you know, pleasurable for them, that they have access to that, you know, that that's, I, I'd hate to see the industry ruin that for all of us. I, one of the things I've referred to a lot of times in my writing along those lines is, you know, the original use of the word euphoric or euphoria was, was used in medical journals to describe the feeling that people felt after being sick and recovering. And so it was one of those things that euphoria was something that was, was highly encouraged because it was, it was a sign that someone was feeling better. And, and that's one thing that, that I try to associate with that word too, with euphoria, that, that there, are, there are appropriate times for those and 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 you're right i i think that the the industry right now or the the delta eight marketing stuff is kind of capitalizing on that but at the same time you know it, there's there's some ethics involved here in in terms of producing these products that people are going to consume with that are looking for a particular effect on, on the back end there's 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 ethics involved. You have to do things correctly. And, and that's the biggest fear that I have there is that um, in order to offload some of this excess CBD, a lot of um, players in the market right now are, are using this to their advantage and, and trying to profit off of something quickly when we haven't really had the opportunity to dig into it much. And, um, I, I just I just wish we would slow down <laughs> just a little bit. And then and then the other thing I was gonna say too is one of the other ways that I look at this is in terms of how the cannabis industry initiated in terms of providing an alternative to pharmaceuticals that may had may have had, you know, side effects or didn't work for certain conditions for certain people. And so we started to offer this natural plant-based alternative and now i feel like the delta eight's taken us back to that that pharmaceutical era you know we're getting back into a man-made product that's supposed to elicit a particular effect but we don't know yet what those side effects or what those processes you know could do to to change how that all processes. And I, I just feel like Delta 8 is about as far away from the roots of this industry as we could possibly get. 
Yeah, I, I could see that because like you mentioned earlier, there it occurs in very, very low amounts in the plant naturally and through degradation. So, you know, we really, like you said, we don't see it in large amounts. So now we're producing these products in larger amounts. And I, and I think in the industry as a whole, as, you know, Delta 10 comes out and we've seen it with CBN, um, you know, people are trying to isolate these cannabinoids that where we have a little bit of research and maybe animals to say it can help with inflammation or cancer. And, um, you know, so the, the industry is, is producing things quicker than we have the research to really, you know, at least as a clinician, feel confident in its applications and risks and side effects and therapeutic benefits. Most definitely. And I think even, you know, it, from the medical standpoint, it's so important because like you said, people are already vulnerable. They're already may have compromised immune systems or they have other things that are happening and introducing any of these, you know, residual chemicals or toxins or other things that may lie in some of these products has has got to be kind of a scary thing you know i i think we have to look at it from that perspective but even on the rec side of things you know i i mentioned before we started recording this podcast i've tried delta 8 a couple of times i got sick both times and and even from a recreational standpoint consumers don't want to use a product that's going to leave them feeling worse afterwards than it did before they took it and so I, I really agree that you know we we need to have consumer education. We need to let them know that that some of these products. And again, I'm not I'm not saying that all the companies in the industry are bad players, but they have to be aware. And and unfortunately, that also means that the companies need to be more transparent. And unfortunately, that's not happening right now in the hemp industry either. So there's definitely some things that need to happen, but. Through conversations like this, I'm hoping that we can get a little more of that consumer awareness out there and, and have people start, you know, asking those critical questions before they run right out to the nearest, um, and I hate to say this too, the nearest gas station <laughs> and purchase a Delta 8 vape cartridge. But, you know, that's that's what's happening. But thanks to you and, and Leaf Report, you know, hopefully we get some of this qualified research into these products and, and we can start using them like they're intended. Absolutely. And get, getting the consumer educated enough so that they can make uh, an informed decision. Definitely. So do you want to just real quick tell our audience, um, you know, where can they go? You mentioned Leaf Report. Where Are there other places or do you have a, a site or anything that you can recommend for people to get some more in-depth information about various products that they're looking at purchasing. Absolutely. So uh, one of my other companies is Radical Health, and we're an education and training company. So we do, we just actually did um, uh, a webinar on Delta 8 and uh, produced a blog as well on it, you know, talking about um, will I test positive if I consume Delta 8, you know, things that we felt consumers needed to know. Um, so it's R-A-D-I-C-L-E healthcare.com. Um, I also work for Leaf 411, which is a free cannabis nurse hotline. So consumers who may be interested in trying Delta 8, but are feeling overwhelmed, or they've purchased a product and don't know how to take it or what to expect, um, those nurses will answer the call for free and provide that consumer education. So that's leaf411.org. Um, and it's a nonprofit 501c3 company. Fantastic. Well, I certainly appreciate your time here today. And, and like, like you said, I just hope that we can start getting some of this consumer information out. And eventually, eventually, I think the market will clean itself up. I think that, um, you know, some of the bad actors will eventually get themselves weeded out and, and products do clean up over time. We've seen that in the cannabis industry. We've seen that everywhere, you know, as, as we start to learn more and as regulations start to come into play and, and, mandated testing and things like that happen, I think we'll see these products improve. But in the meantime, more more kudos to you for doing the research that you're doing and getting the information out there because it's, it's so vital. It's so vital right now. Well, thanks for having me. I mean, we still have a lot of maturing to do in the industry, but we're getting there. 